All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Or so claims Leo Tolstoy in the opening lines of his book, Anna Karenina. Um, as opening lines go, I've always found that a good one. Today we get to look at Abraham's not-so-modern or modern family, depending on how you want to look at it. And I want to jump right into the text for this morning. Uh, and if we're reading two longer sections of scripture. We're going to be reading Genesis 16, the whole chapter, which is 16 verses. And then we're going to be reading Genesis 21, verses 1 to 21. We need to hear these stories um, before we talk about them. So Genesis 16 and then Genesis 21, 1 to 21. And I'm going to ask that we please stand together for the reading of the word, which I will do a little awkwardly because I broke my foot last weekend. Um, but I can stand on one foot, so that's okay. So here we go, Genesis 16. Now Sarah, Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you got, come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy, that is the one who hears. For she had said, she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Um, sorry, the one who sees, not the one who hears. Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Now Genesis 21, verses 1 to 21. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, the time of which God had spoken. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of water, gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under a bush, and then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. 
for she said, Do not let me look upon the death of my child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. The word of the Lord. Let's be seated together. Yeah. When I'm preparing the sermon, the first thing I do is I get into the text. I read it multiple times, I ponder it, I write out notes. Um, I write out things like what stands out to me, um, main themes that I'm seeing, questions that I have, things I don't understand or realize that I need to do more research into. I read these two passages and I sat there for a few minutes and then the first thing I wrote down was, what a mess. What a mess. I know lots of people who read these stories and they get angry. Um, it seems like injustice is everywhere. Um, a lot of it, to our eyes, just or to our ears, it sounds absurd. It sounds like what? Um, and I read this, and I think I find myself thinking, what a disaster. But I also read this, and I realize I find myself thinking, um, what were they thinking? Like, what were they doing? And I didn't, I know now, well, I don't know the answer. I didn't know the answer. Now, ultimately, of course, I never get to know what Abram and Sarai were thinking. I don't get to delve into their heads and find out. But um, I can get a lot closer, and we can get a lot closer to the answer by understanding some of the, the cultural norms and expectations that they lived in. And that's what I mean when I say I, I find myself thinking, what were they thinking? I, I literally find that I don't understand what they're doing. And to me, when I'm reading a text, that's a cue. That's a cue that there is something foreign about the people in the world of the text that, that's just not my world. Um, and that is absolutely the case here. So that's the place to start. Let's actually, like, before we can really... Um, pull anything out of this text and we can learn from it before we can even hear it properly, we need to understand the context. So what's going on here? Um, what's, what's happening? Well, to get into this, we need to have somewhat of a cultural introduction to ancient Near Eastern thoughts and customs around reproduction, marriage, surrogacy, and descendants. Okay? Um, so I know you didn't come to the sermon expecting to get that kind of a lesson, but it is where we have to start. Briefly. We'll do this briefly. So in the ancient Near East, reproduction is, is, is envisioned as a similar process to agriculture. When you want to grow a plant, you take a seed of that plant and you place it into the ground, good soil, right? And then you, you tend it as it grows and you get the plant. If you want to grow corn, you plant corn. If you want to grow carrots, you plant carrots. And much like in agriculture, their view of reproduction was, first of all, um, that seeds rarely fail, but the soil can. And secondly, that the identity of the plant that grows is based in the seed, right? It's not in the soil. If you plant corn, it doesn't matter what kind of soil you plant it in, you're going to grow corn or you're going to grow nothing, right? The corn can be anywhere on the spectrum from dead to fully healthy and flourishing and anywhere in between because of the soil, but it's corn because you planted a corn seed. Now, why are we going into this? Because the view was that um, the children are the children of the father. The seed, the male seed, is what provides the identity. This, therefore, created a certain expectation, a certain space for, for surrogacy, right? Now, before I jump into that, what about marriage? Marriage is viewed as, among other things, being very importantly and primarily about the continuation of the family line. 
it was a wife's duty to provide children for her husband so that his family name could continue. And we actually have existent copies of marriage contracts from the, the nations uh, in the ancient Near East in the time of Abraham and, and afterwards um, that specify these two people are going to get married and that this wife is expected to provide children for her husband. And if she can't, if she is unable to provide children, one of two things will occur. First of all, this is grounds for divorce. If you can't provide your husband with children, he needs to find someone who can. And in that quest, he can leave you behind. He can leave you on the wayside. But the option for that was there for the wife, if she was unable to provide children herself, to gift her husband with a surrogate, with a slave woman who would bear children on her behalf, right? Now, why was this an option? Because the identity of the children is found in the seed. So if your wife turns out to be not good soil, then she could provide good soil for you and in that way fulfill her wifely duties, right? Um, so what goes on in Genesis 16 uh, strange and, and, and disastrous as it sounds to our modern ears, um, was culturally the way things are supposed to go. Um, now, when this occurs, so your wife cannot bear you children, she gives you with a surrogate, and the surrogate successfully bears children, those children belong to the father as any of his children would, the surrogate remains a slave. Right? This too is specified in those contracts and, and, and writings that if she is able to, to conceive and, and bear a son, specifically a son, because a son is needed to, to continue the family line, um, she does not find herself in a higher status position now because of this. She stays among the slaves. So, Abraham is gifted Hagar. She conceives, and then she starts getting uh, uppity. She starts viewing Sarah with contempt. Um, she starts trying to move beyond her position, which she's not allowed to do. And, and Abram's response to Sarah is the culturally valid and appropriate response. He says to her, um, your slave girl is in your power. Do as you please. She was your slave before you gave her to me. She is still your slave now. The fact that she has become a surrogate and that she has successfully conceived has not changed her position, says Abraham, according to the customs of the day. Now, okay, so all of this that's going on makes sense. So too does what happens in Genesis 21. Um, Sarah wants them gone so that they will not share in the inheritance. Why? Because Ishmael is a legitimate heir. He is a legitimate descendant of Abraham. He was born not through some uh, misconduct or some affair or, or anything like that. He was born through a legal, culturally accepted, justifiable proceeding of surrogacy that makes him the oldest son of Abraham. And so she wants him gone. And hopefully that then begins to show you that a lot of these things that are happening, as strange as they are to our modern ears, fit the world that they lived in. It's also important to note, however, that they don't fit into God's ways and God's plans. Um, this is made explicit in Genesis 17. God speaks of, of how Ishmael is not going to be the son of the promise, but it's already implicit in Genesis 16. One of the interesting things about narratives in the Old Testament is that there's a lot of places where they don't pronounce judgment. They just present what happened. This is what happened. Bing, 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 bing. Right? Events follow one after the other. And, and you're sitting there thinking, but was that okay? And, and the text isn't concerned with telling you that because it's just telling you what happened. And you'll find out later, perhaps, kind of God's thoughts on this and whether or not it was okay. Um, but sometimes it is made clear implicitly. And how they do that is by patterning and repetition. So here in Genesis chapter 16, um, what goes on is that there is a direct paralleling between Sarah's actions in giving Hagar to Abraham and Eve's actions 
in taking the fruit from the tree and giving it to her husband. The verb sequence is identical in ordering and in content. Now, so Eve says, Adam listens, Eve takes and gives to her husband. Sarah says, Abraham listens, Sarah takes and gives to her husband. The ordering, the form, the, it's all identical. The consequences are mirrored as well. What happens after Adam and Eve take from the tree and eat is that they have to leave the garden. What happens after Sarah takes Hagar and gives her to Abram is Hagar has to leave twice, right? What happens after Adam and Eve leave the garden? God meets them to renew their hope and provide a way forward. What happens after Hagar has to leave the household of Abram and Sarah both times? God meets her and renews her hope. And so the whole thing is modeled on the fall narrative. Um, why is that? Because the text is saying to us that in the same way that Adam and Eve took God's plan into their own hands to seek their own blessing and make their own way and be disobedient as a result, so Sarah is doing the same thing. But what becomes clear as you understand the cultural context of all of this is that this whole thing is about fear. Go back to the beginning of the story, Genesis 16. Sarah is in an incredibly difficult position. She has failed in her duties as a wife. She has failed to provide an heir. She's failed for a long time. Even after God has come to them and promised them that they will be a great nation and that they will have children, it's been 10 years. And Sarah is not having children. And Sarah, you can see in verse 2, believes that that this has to be from the Lord. Who else could do this, right? The Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Um, and she's in a position of terrible vulnerability because Abram could divorce her and leave her with nothing. And they're far from home. It's not like she's with her family or would have anywhere to go. They've been traveling in Canaan for 10 years, right? Like they're gone. Um, she's got, I don't know what their marriage was like. I don't know how strong it was. It clearly had lasted a while, but at the same time, Abram has shown himself quite willing to use Sarah for his own ends and for his own safety. They go to Egypt and pretend that she's his sister and she gets taken into the household of Pharaoh. Like, these aren't actions that make you feel particularly secure in your position as his wife. And so she's come to the point where she realize, she feels like she has to do something. And in her fear, she gives Hagar to Abraham um, to have children. She takes things into her own hands. Now for her, I imagine it had to feel initially like a win-win-win. She's going to fulfill her duty. She's going to remove herself from this vulnerable position. And she's going to move God's plan forward. Because we can all do that um, on our own. But it's got to feel like, you know what, this is a good idea. Her plan naturally leads to its own immediate danger, though. Her position is now threatened by a younger and more fertile wife that she has given to Abraham, um, and who is treating her with contempt, which is an indication that she was trying to take over Sarah's position in some way. Um, and this just brings on more fear. And what does she do out of that fear? Abraham says, she's your slave, do what you want. And so she starts to, to lash out. She starts to treat Hagar quite harshly. She's going to put her back in her place. Hagar naturally responds with her own fear, but whereas Sarah's position is one of strength relative to Hagar, Sarah has power, and so out of Sarah's fear she can hurt, Hagar's position is a position of weakness relative to Sarah, and so out of her fear she flees. Um, and, and as I say, you begin to see that Genesis 16 and Genesis 21 are a series of fears. Sarah is afraid because she's not given Abraham any children. Then she's afraid because she has, but through Hagar rather than herself. After Isaac is born, Sarah's fear is renewed. For now the miraculous child of God, the son that she has born herself in her old age, is threatened by a rival heir, the firstborn son, Ishmael. Abraham now becomes afraid 
because Sarah wants to kick them out. And Abram's worried about Ishmael. What's going to happen if we cast him out, right? Um, and finally, we return to Hagar as she is sent away from Abraham and Sarah. And she is afraid that they are going to starve to death in the wilderness. And she is very much afraid to watch her son die. Fear at every turn. It may sound familiar to a lot of people today who are walking in similar, not circumstances, um, that would be strange, but similar in that there is fear at every turn. And I know I've talked about fear before. Fear as an emotional experience is initially a natural response to adverse circumstances. It communicates danger. In its proper place, fear is a lot like pain. Pain informs me of something that I need to pay attention to and react to. My hand is in the fire, I need to get it out. Um, but sometimes our nerves act up. We feel phantom pain or something hurts, but we have to push through the pain. So even the simplest kind of information like pain requires discernment. This is even more true around emotions. Fear ought to alert us of danger. It ought to alert us of a real circumstance that is actually threatening that we need to respond to. But fear, just like pain, can be wrong. And so I have to ask if my fear is justified. I have to decide on an appropriate response to the circumstances that have elicited fear. The trouble with fear, like pain, is that it can be so overwhelming that I simply respond, um, that I just act out of my fear. And that's problematic because while fear can be a great messenger, it is always a terrible counselor. Fear tells me I'm weak. Fear tells me I must panic and act now before it's too late. Fear tells me to take care of what, number one, to take care of myself take care of what matters to me. Fear narrows perspective in terms of options. That's why I feel weak. In terms of time, that's why I feel urgency and panic. And in terms of relationships, and that's why I feel selfishness. And so when I'm driven by fear, I inevitably sin. And we can see that again and again in Genesis 16 and Genesis 21. When fear is the driving force in our life, we will take things into our own hands and try to make them work. We will lash out and hurt the people around us. We will run from the things that cause us fear, and we will bring about division in our relationships. These things will happen when we are driven by fear, and all of those things happen in Genesis 16 and 21. I'll say those again. When we are driven by fear, we will take things into our own hands. Instead of trusting in God, we'll try to make them happen on our own. We will lash out and treat the people around us harshly. We will flee from those things we feel like we cannot handle. And we will cause division, separation, and, and, and damage to relationships in our lives. These are the things that we will do. And we see them all in Genesis 16 and 21. Now, at this point, I think, I hope, that we've come to a position of being able to still say about Genesis 16 and 21, what a mess, but also to say to, about them, like, okay, but we see what's happening here. The question, I think, that we're meant to ask as we read this is where is God in all of this? Where is God in the midst of this fear and the sin that follows? Start with Sarah. Sarah decides to take things into her own hands to make a way forward. And, just as when Adam and Eve did this, the result was to create new obstacles rather than new ways forward. Adam and Eve are suddenly caught in their death and have to be removed from the garden lest they live forever in their brokenness. Sarah is caught in her own plan. It succeeds and now she's stuck. Where is God in the midst of this? God is faithfully overcoming obstacles, even the ones Sarah has created for herself. And you can see how this speaks to fear. Fear says there's no way forward. I must act now or all is lost. God says, I am the one who makes a way and you need me. How do we see that? God enfolds Ishmael and Hagar into his plan and into his blessing while protecting Sarah and Abraham and their unborn son Isaac, so that the plan with them may move forward as well. What about the fears of Hagar? When she first leaves, God is the one who meets her to tell her to go back. 
Not only that, he gives her amazing promises over his son Ishmael, over her son Ishmael. Hagar knows that she has experienced something amazing and declares that God is the one who sees. She gives him that name, El Roy, the God who sees. And indeed he is. In the midst of Hagar's fears, God is present. He sees and he knows and he is good. And again, you can see how God speaks to fear. Fear says, I am alone. Fear says, no one cares. Fear says, I have to handle this. God says, I'm with you. I see. And I care more than you could imagine or understand. What about the whole debacle over the rival heirs? Fear tells Sarah and Abraham and Hagar in different ways that there's not enough. There's not enough inheritance for Isaac and Ishmael to share. And so they must be cast out. Not enough for Ishmael if he is cast out. Not enough food and water for him and for Hagar to survive. If there's a, more, if there's a fear more common than this one, that there's not enough, I'm not sure what it is. Um, not enough to share, not enough to give, not enough to hope. There ain't room in this town for the both of us, right? Um, and into this fear that each of them carries in their own way, God speaks. There's more than enough. I can bless Isaac to be a great nation, and I can make Ishmael the father of nine princes. I can bless you to be a blessing, even though you try to take that plan into your own hands, and now things are more complicated than they would have been. Abraham to the child of promise, and to the child of your own grasping after the things that you wanted and didn't want to wait for. I can bless them both. I can bless you in the midst of your sin, and I can bless you in the midst of your faithfulness. And so God, in the midst of fear, speaks up and says, I am faithful, and I am good, and in me there is more than enough. It's no accident that our text today so strongly emphasizes the faithfulness of God. Chapter 16 is all about the setup for that. God has promised a child to Abraham and Sarah, but none has come. It's been 10 years. When will it happen? When will he be faithful? Um, and then a child is born, but it's not the child of promise. And God responds by making even more promises. Promises to Hagar about what Ishmael's future will look like. We spend eight chapters wondering how in the world Abraham and Sarah are going to have children. And then she just does. Chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said. The Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Three times in those first two verses, the faithfulness of God is emphasized. And it is emphasized again and again through these chapters. I love what John Walton has to say about this. He's a commentator on Genesis. He says, What God does should never cease to amaze us. But that he consistently shows himself capable of doing what he does without apparent effort is strikingly commonplace and entirely unremarkable. And that's the feeling you get when you read Genesis 21. It's like, this is so understated, right? They've been waiting for this at this point for 24 years. And it says, The Lord dealt with Sarah as he'd said. The Lord did what he promised. She conceived at the time that he had spoken of. Um, it's so understated, but it's so clearly all about God's faithfulness. Having been faithful to Abraham and Sarah, we find later in the chapter, 21, 18 to 21, that God repeats his promises to Hagar even more faithfully, forcefully, sorry, and is faithful to rescue them from adverse circumstances so that he can continue to fulfill his promises to them and be faithful. So what does Genesis 16 and Genesis 21 say to us in the midst of our fears? It says God is faithful. And I think a lot of us need to hear this today. Whether we're thinking about COVID or we're thinking about the elections or we're thinking about political turmoil throughout the, the world, we need to hear that God is faithful. And in the midst of whatever fears we are experiencing, we can trust him. We can know that he is good, good beyond our ways, good beyond the ways of the world, right? And the temptation today, just as it was for Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 16, is to turn to the ways of the world around you and look to them for hope. We've been waiting for 10 years. We haven't had children. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do what everybody else does when they have this kind of situation. We're going to find a surrogate. We're going to have children a different way. 
um, whether you're looking at political processes today or you're looking at other places where the world says this is where you can find hope, that's not actually the case. Those things will always be mixed. Mixed with good and bad, mixed with success and failure, mixed with, with sin and grace. But God isn't mixed. And in Him, there is always hope. Our call to worship this morning was 2 Timothy 1.7. And as Paul writes to Timothy, who himself seemed to have been dealing with some fear, he says to him, God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. If you find yourself overwhelmed by fear in these days, you need to turn to God. It's what Abraham and Sarah should have done and what they do learn to do eventually. Right? It's their journey of faith, it's episodes in the life of Abram where they grow in faith to the point where they know God and they can turn to him in the midst of that. We need to do the same, and he has promised that when we turn to him and we invite him into our life and we accept him as our Lord and our Savior, we give ourselves to him, that he fills us with his spirit, with, the, with, this, with his love, and in that we have a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And I've, I've found it, very insightful that Paul writes these things because those are the three things we need in the face of fear. Fear tells me I'm weak. The Spirit of God says, in God you are strong. Fear tells me I need to be selfish. I need to take care of myself. The Spirit of God says God loves you more than you can imagine and, he, and you can, in the power of God, love those around you. Fear says I need to panic. I need to take things into my own hands and I need to act now. But the Spirit of God says, no, you can be disciplined in the midst of this. You choose to trust God, and you can choose his ways. So let us learn from the story of Abraham and Sarah that God is faithful, that we can trust him, and let us walk in the spirit of God so that we can have that spirit of power and love and self-discipline. If that's not something you've done before, inviting God into your life, repenting and giving yourself to him, then I invite you to do that this morning. You just need to pray that to him. Tell him that's what you want. If you do that, talk to someone. You're meant to walk this journey together. If that's something you have done, but you find yourself still wrestling with fear, then turn to God with that. Come to him in prayer. Ask to be filled with his spirit. Ask to have eyes to see, like Hagar was gifted eyes to see the well in the wilderness. Ask God to give you eyes to see his faithfulness and his hope. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, and your grace. May we have our eyes fixed on you, that we may know your hope, your goodness, your ways. May we trust in you and experience your spirit within us, your spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. Lead us to discern well the fears that we experience, Lord God, and to respond well, knowing that you and Lord, I pray for anybody who's taking those first steps this morning. Meet them in hope and in faithfulness and lead them to others of us who know you and can walk together. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It's always my privilege to end with a blessing. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance to you and bring you peace. Go in the name of Jesus. Amen.